Greetings, fellow armchair Imagineers. Tiki here. And Blue Dragon 5. And Hellboy 2004 is indeed a movie that exists. And it's pretty good. All right, that's it. We did our part. See you guys later. Happy <laughs> April Fool's Day. No, I'm just kidding, obviously. <laughs> Go, Gios. You gave me the idea. All right, folks. Tonight we're doing the Hellboy 20th anniversary retrospective. But, Dragon, I got to be honest with you. You're not going to like this. But uh, Hellboy 2004 is a movie that exists. Is more or less my thesis on this movie. This, Dragon, this movie did not hold up on a rewatch for me. Look, it's not terrible. It really isn't. Obviously, it's not. It's got a lot of good things going for it. Uh, first and foremost being the two, you know, you got Ron Perlman as the title character, who's just impeccable casting and impeccable performance. I'm sure we'll get into that. And then obviously, Guillermo del Toro's style is great. Dragon, my big issue with this movie is that, my God, does it get bogged down in, like, the early 2000s superhero cliches. Dragon, the love triangle in this movie, man, it is a fucking problem how much screen time and real estate the love triangle of this movie takes up. Especially when you consider that in the comics... It wasn't even a love interest, and the romantic rival didn't even fucking exist! I, I, Dragon, there are elements in this movie that I'm really not crazy about at all. Um, I think that the, the villain is pretty forgettable. The action sequences are honestly kind of repetitive just by the nature of the, the main creature, you know, the nature of him duplicating himself. It kind of gets a little repetitive. That being said, obviously there are good things here. We have, uh, you know, we got our David Hyde Pierce dragon. We get to talk about David Hyde Pierce. Uh, John Hurt has a very memorable supporting role. They, there are good things here, for sure. But man, this movie has not really aged all that well. And obviously, the Golden Army is way, way better. And no, the 2019 reboot is definitely worse than this. Don't get it twisted. Come on now. <laughs> All right, Dragon, I'm curious, just on a rewatch. Are, are, do, you, do you feel any of what, it, like, I, I really don't want to be, like, outwardly negative about this. And like I said, I, I did enjoy the movie, but I didn't walk away loving it like I was hoping I would. Well, look, I, one, I love the Del Toro Hellboy films. I love both of these movies. I want to be very clear about that. Now, again, if you ask me which one I prefer, I will say The Golden Army. A lot of reasons for that. I mean, they're, they're, they're both they're slightly different films when you hold them up side by side. Uh, you know, for, for example, uh, the original Hellboy film was very much an adaptation of the comic. They're adapting like the origin, basically the big flagship Hellboy story to adapt. Uh -huh. um, I mean, I really like living with the characters and kind of introducing characters like Johan Kraus. And uh, again, I think our bad guy is very much a big, you know, kind of big improvement in Golden Army. Again, that's Golden Army, though. Um, look, I will agree with you. Just basically, I'll agree with you on the two points there. Yes, Golden Army, at least in my humble opinion, too, is the film I would go to. But here, here's the thing, though. I also agree that, yes, I will defend the villains in this, but I will say, the yes, the, the weakest part of the film is the love triangle. I admit that, okay? That is, yes. <laughs> Good. It's, it's the symbol of the of the, of the, of the, you know, the early 2000s thing. But here's oh, yeah, the thing big time, big time. But I would, I would fight you on the other points, saying like the other things necessarily mar it. Where here's the thing: so this film, for its time, you got to remember, early two thousands when they're setting up shop for the superhero films. Okay, it's a, it, it's very much a, a period of experimentation. We're getting things going, and Hellboy's place really interestingly, kind of in the center of all that. Where this film, I would say, with the exception of Love Triangle, which is which we'll get into with the background, is kind of almost feels almost like kind of like a cost of doing business sort of thing to get this movie made. Sure. Um, this movie, I would attest, was ahead of its time for the early two thousand superhero films, as far as those go. Because I mean, 
this was like, we're going to do a film that's on our own terms. So in a sense, there was kind of like a little bit of a, there was a crowd swell. There's a little bit of a Deadpool kind of situation in terms of getting this thing made and getting it made on its own terms. I mean, give or take the whole love triangle thing, which again, we'll get to, but that's what I'm saying. Like this thing, uh, you know, it, it lifted the character. Hellboy got a lot of attention, got a lot of notoriety. Uh, really, you know, again, it was so rarely do we have a character that kind of relatively new where you have, um, I mean, even, but even by Deadpool standards, Deadpool was about, uh, let's see, Deadpool and Hellboy are kind of contemporaries, but it took Deadpool a little bit, you know, there's a little more space between when we get the dead, Deadpool being created and then the Deadpool character. Hellboy, though, this is roughly a 10-year period from when the character's created to when the movie happens. Roughly. Uh -huh. More like 11 if you want to split hairs. But let's just say, you know, Hellboy's created in 93. So, you know, if you want to... The point being, it's just so unique that we have a situation like that when, you know, the characters, you know, you know the characters kind of breath in this world because usually Batman, you have, like, you know, decades worth of material and then we adapt him for the first time and then we adapt him again, you know? <laughs> Sure, sure. So, I just love the mundanity of our hero. I think he's got a really solid origin. Uh, Del Toro style, I think, marries very well into Hellboy. And I think, ultimately, this is a very you know remarkably unique film that I think has remained so 20 years later, albeit... Again, I think it's using the bare minimum of, of the cliches. At least, you know, with, with the, as far as the early 2000s I, I, stuff goes. I mean, I feel like the love triangle is literally, like, one of the big focal points of the plot, though. Yes, which I, I agree, okay? We're <laughs> stuck with the love triangle, okay? All I right. like the love triangle, but we're stuck with it, so we're going <laughs> to move on. Right. Okay. Okay, Dragon. Uh, I, I tried to watch some making of stuff, but uh, what do you got? All right, so the background, just to give you the salient points here on the background, it's really interesting. So... Again, Hellboy, the character created by Mike Mignola. Uh, basically, what happened was, uh, you know, he was doing like, you know, like usually when you do a convention, like a Comic Con or a convention, they ask the artist to do little sketches. They put in like, you know, like the book that everyone they try they try and move like, hey, buy the sketch, the commemorative sketchbook for the Comic Con this year, and get all the artists to sign, giving people an incentive to see all the artists circulate the cons. And Mike yeah. Mignola submitted a sketch. And it's like, yeah, just draw anything you want, Mike. Um, maybe the theme was monsters that year. I'm not sure. Sometimes there's a theme. In this case, Mike Mayo loves to draw monsters. He drew a monster and, uh, you know, had like the space on like the belt buckle of the monster. And he said, you know, something's kind of missing here. And he wrote Hellboy on there and people loved it. They ate it up. And he says, man, that was kind of fun. <laughs> it didn't, doesn't really look like the final version of Hellboy at all. It's kind of a generic monster. But just like the idea of the kind of a monster is kind of a character with like Hellboy written there, crack people up. And Mignola recently, you know, by the time he did that sketch, you know, he had uh, he'd finally kind of broken into the business. He did a Batman comic, uh, one of the Legends of the Dark Knight uh, issues, which uh, went really well. And basically, it was kind of Batman dealing with the supernatural, which was kind of Mignola's niche. And he basically thought, like, I want my own Batman that I can do supernatural stories with. I don't have to just like, and this is like a rare example of Batman dealing with the supernatural. Like, no, I want a character who can exclusively deal with the supernatural. Sure. So it uh, kind of like kind of spun off from there. Like, okay, I'm going to combine all the, all my great loves. Like, basically, this character is going to be kind of part Frankenstein, part ape, and big one, his father. A lot of Mignola's father is in the Hellboy character. Huge amount of them is in there. Like, for example, uh, his his father was a cabinet maker. So he was he was a very blue collar guy. He would have like the whole idea of like Hellboy having the right hand of doom that comes from his father coming home with like bloody gashes and everything in his. Oh, hand. that makes sense. You know, he was a smoker again, blue collar guy. Pretty much, the attitude of Hellboy is is very much verbatim. You know, Mignola's father, uh, and Mike uh. Mignola had this like this old school kind of western kind of like duster overcoat, which is where Hellboy gets the that's the exact coat that Hellboy's wearing. Mignola has that coat. That's an iconic costume for a for a superhero. So that's that that's really that's a really good pull for sure. And it was very much like when he, he, he drew him, just Hellboy was kind of missing something in the designs. Like you know, he just he, he looks cool. He's got the big bare chest and everything, but something's just kind of missing. And they threw the coat on. I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> but Batman without his cape, we've given him his cape. Uh huh. So, uh, you know, again, so Hellboy created 93. We're rough. I think it's like from 93 to 97 at this point. Hellboy's been around for a little bit. And uh, you know, Hellboy's starting to get popular, and Dark Horse asks Mignola, hey, you want to option this as a movie? Which Mignola thinks they're never, ever going to adapt this. It'll be basically, they'll pay you to option this movie. He says, I'll take the money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So 
not in a greedy way, but just like, okay, free money for something I'm never going to have to worry about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Del Toro, rising star at this point in time, you know, in the early, in, you know, kind of the, the late 90s, you know, Del Toro's a rising star. He's just finished Mimic, and while he's working on Mimic, he was in kind of a dark place, stressful movie to make. And uh, the thing that kept him sane was Hellboy. He read, he discovered oh, nice, Hellboy nice. comics and he read them and he fell in love with them. And basically he wanted to do like a movie that was kind of a thank you to the character. So he met with you know, Mike Mignola, you know, they kind of set up a little meeting. Fun fact, just given the day we're doing this on, they kind of pulled a prank on Mike Richardson, the guy who's in charge of Dark Horse. And they both, they met each other, they hit it off really great. Okay. Mike Richardson's concerned both of them are going to tank the meetings. So we're going to act like the meeting went horrible just to throw Mike Richardson, <laughs> Richardson off. So that's, that was their big meeting. You know, like it's really cute. Like Del Toro gave him a nickname. He gives everyone nicknames. Del Toro, it, it sounds like from the behind the scenes stuff that I saw, <laughs> it sounds like Del Toro and Mignola really kind of had some bromance energy going on when they met each other. Is that on, correct? On the first movie, absolutely. Uh -huh. the first movie, yes. Yeah. Second movies were things kind of hit a schism. Oh, no, really? Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, I hate to hear that. I hate to hear that. Not, I want to be very clear. It's not, a, it's not a super negative. It was like a very, it, it's kind of like a, it's like a Kurt sort of thing, you know, where it's very much like... <laughs> Right. That's the thing. Like they weren't like mad at each other, but it was a sort of like they parted ways, and it was a very, oh. it was a very kind of like it was a very sobering kind of moment of realization. Like, oh, we have to part ways. <laughs> that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, point being, uh, so you know they're 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 you know they become fast friends, and instinctively the big thing cement that solidified their friendship and got the movie going is that the first things out of their mouth when they're talking about doing a doing a Hellboy movie is okay. We should do it as kind of a. They, they agreed on two things. Should be made as if Ray Harryhausen made this movie. Hence all the stop motion y kind of like kind of look to the same. I mean, that's just Del Toro's style in general, but yeah. yes, it's a very good philosophy to have. So, them being huge monster fans, we got to have a lot of Harryhausen, or at least a Harryhausen vibe in this. And secondly, most importantly, Ron Perlman has to play Hellboy. They were very oh. simpatico. They knew, in mind, this is like Ron Perlman after the Beauty and the Beast show. That's probably where they're at. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's like such a. They, I'm sure that honestly, probably most of our audience doesn't even know what that Beauty and the Beast show is. Oh, they have no idea to get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're familiar with the Beauty and the Beast. Oh, yes. Oh, I was familiar with the Beauty and the Beast show before Hellboy came out. Yes. So, really, I would say, I mean, that was probably the biggest thing Perlman had done up to that point. So, everyone had really, it was like the soap opera, essentially. Like, like <laughs> right, right. Not yeah, here's the thing. Like, I never watched the Beauty and the Beast show, but you you bet your ass my mom was invested in it. I mean, that's, that's the thing. Beauty and the Beast show was less, it was like the only good soap opera. <laughs> you know, it was like, all soap, usually, like the usual, like long running, like medical or like, you know, like rack, backstabbing rich people soap operas are terrible. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's just uh, like, Little Blue's like, also mentioning uh, Star Trek Nemesis is something that. Ron Perlman was in. But even then, that's the thing. So Perlman, he was in a lot of things. And I think, I want to say, I forget if it was Chariot. I think it was, I think it's Chariot. No, not Chariots of Fire. It might have been Quest for Fire. He did this movie. He played a caveman. It was a big, it was a big thing. But that's thing. He'd been getting bit parts that he had to fight tooth and nail for in movies. But TV, he really excelled at Beauty and the Beast because no one else wanted to be caked in that makeup. And he did it. And, you know, he, he made it work. Also, uh, a little blues pointing out Perlman voiced uh, Slade. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry, I yeah, was pointed that out. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so uh, yeah, Ron Perlman, of course, uh, definitive Slade from uh, the Teen Titans animated show, the good one. Oh yes. But uh, yeah, so that's the thing. So Perlman, he had been, uh, you know, like, the Beauty Beast was a big thing. That was a big reason he was very keen for the project because you know he he was used to working in like caked in makeup and and doing a really good job. And so he was not scared off by like you know, being made up to be, look like Hellboy. And it was it was rather easy for him. You kind know? of funny how Perlman and Doug Jones are almost kind of like filmmaking siblings when it comes to that particular element of their career, right? Yeah, no, ab absolutely, yeah. Okay, so here's the big problem, the reason this movie uh, took so long to get made. Because you know, all these talks are going like 97 and 98, and the movie comes out in 04. The reason is the, the, not a studio would touch this movie. I mean, you had the title, you had just the, the whole idea of like you know, basically what Hellboy was as a concept. But the big one was, again, at the time, Ron Perlman as Hellboy was the deal breaker. We need a name star. We need oh, a big God. star. That was a lot, but again, T, we're in that early, you know, that late '90s, early. Yeah, 2000s I era. know. I I remember. I they remember. They would not make this movie unless they had a big star, and the you know who they, you know who they wanted. 
Oh, I don't actually know. There were a couple names thrown up, but the two biggies were Ooh. the main one, like Del Toro like says in jest, like this is who they wanted. <laughs> The Rock, Dwayne Johnson. They oh no! Oh my God! This is like young Dwayne Johnson too. <laughs> Dude, so that would have been fucking miserable, bro. And Plan B, Vin Diesel. Oh God! Oh man! I heard this one. I heard recently. I don't know how true. The thing with one both is. of the people that you brought up is that they're personas are totally indistinguishable indistinguishable from any of the characters that they actually play. Yep. Whereas Perlman's kind of the opposite. Perlman, like, he's literally a chameleon. He'll blend into any character that he puts on. Yet, oddly, the reason Perlman really worked for this, though, is that basically it was kind of it was serendipity. I mean, I, I understand the point you're making there, T. I don't disagree with it, but with, with, with Ron Perlman, though, the main reason they want him is that that guy feels like Hellboy already. No, he and does. Like, he does. You're right. It's You're right. Thing. It's like Downey Jr. as Iron Man or Ryan Reynolds as a Deadpool. It just felt like this guy's put on but this. I mean, with Downey movie. Jr. as Iron Man, that's another thing where it's like it's not like he played a ton of roles that were Tony no. Stark esque before that. It was just the You're energy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like, basically, it's the fact you want a real actor. You want a guy who's who's been who's been all the roles. You know, a guy who's like he's essentially Prom was like the like the a grade A character actor, but like the top like the best character actor you could ever have. Oh well, yeah, know? absolutely. Uh, let's see, Little Blue. I think that uh, Stallone or Schwarzenegger as Hellboy in like a '90s movie would be much better than The Rock or Vin Diesel. Honestly, yeah. wouldn't be great. Definitely wouldn't be as good as Perlman, but it would be better. <laughs> yeah, well, these are like the names the studio was like throwing at him and Del Toro very much so like F that you know very emphatically you know, <laughs> and even like Ron Perlman Del like, Toro throw it out his uh his Barry Toro energy <laughs> I mean Del Toro does like to curse a lot during the panels and everything oh he does <laughs> But the best of things is Del Toro is kind of, he's very blunt and I love him for it. Just as him just throw it, throw it out there saying, no, we're not going to do it without, without Ron Perlman, which is why the film took five years to make. Uh-huh. Uh, so that's basically what the solution to all this, you're probably wondering how the heck do we get it made. He did Blade 2 for two reasons. He agreed to do Blade 2 because you know, Blade was very popular. It was essentially the first real you know, resurgence of the comic book movie after Batman and Robin. Very big. And basically, it proved that uh, one, Del Toro could do a superhero movie, and two, it would have Ron Perlman in a lead role as the bad guy in that film. Ah, oh, right, guy, right. That was the main reason, because Ron Perlman was kind of Del Toro's good luck charm to a degree at that point, so he loved Perlman. He wanted to put him in it. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, so they get him, the project, after after Blade 2 exists, you know, with, they get the, they get the green light finally, and then they're, you know, they're adapting Seeds of Destruction, the original, you know, the original Hellboy, the big Hellboy story. It's a very much, they kind of approach the movie like it's not a full-on adaptation of, like, Mike Mignola stuff, it's a fusion. It's Mignola and Del Toro collaborating versus, like, a straight-on, like, we're going to slavishly, like, Watchmen-level adapt Mike Mignola's work, you know? Uh-huh. It's a 130-day shoot, mostly in Prague. Uh, Marco uh, Beltrami, uh, the the composer, was the compo composer on this, who also very notably was the composer on Logan. Nice, nice. Okay, lastly, um, you know, movie was a success, just enough of a success. You know, made its money back, made a little bit extra, and more so, huge DVD sales, which is how we get a Ooh. sequel. If that, okay, you if know what? Uh, go yeah. ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Had the had the DVD had the DVD not sold out like crazy, we would not have a Hellboy two. Okay, Dragon. I actually, I'm glad you mentioned specifically Hellboy physical media because I oh, kind of yeah. have a funny nostalgic story about that. Hit him with it. Hit him with okay. it. Okay, I, I I don't think I don't think my story is what you think it is. <laughs> just just okay. so you know, <laughs> I, uh, I would be very surprised if it is. Honestly. Okay. okay, Dragon. Do you remember the PSP, the PlayStation Portable? Yeah, this definitely is not going the way I thought it would. Be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I remember what the PSP was. But I don't remember like in conjunction with this movie, but yes. Well, do you okay specifically? Do you remember that back when the PSP first came out? In addition to games, they had uh, movies that you could buy for it, like on little like little PSP discs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Hellboy was one of the few PSP UMD movies. Universal right. Media Disc movies yeah. that I own. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, just fun fact there. Just well, let me tell you up. this: the DVD releases, 
the DVD releases for Hellboy, though, they were like the things you and I you know, drooled over, like the chock full of features, you know, had like, you know, well, let me this way, chock full, like, again, very in very in depth making of stuff, you know, and, and a bunch of commentaries. Del Toro usually goes all out with the bonus stuff. I think that's kind of part of his thing. Oh, yeah. All right. So, again, movie, Labyrinth as well was uh, very robust in the bonus features. I would imagine Hellboy might have been a, kind of a champion for that, given that get got enough money to make a sequel. So, <laughs> for sure. For sure. So, again, the Hellboy comic sales doubled because of the movie. Mignola, he expanded the universe of Hellboy because now the the readership was there. He basically, that led to all the spinoffs and stuff and why we probably have a Johan Krauss. Uh huh. And uh, basically uh, made Ron Perlman's career. I mean, he got lead gigs after this movie, you know, because everyone's like Sons of Anarchy, Hand of God. You know, he's getting these these, these the bigger roles. People recognize, oh man, we love Hellboy, and you know, he he looks very fondly on the character. Sure, sure. I mean, he was he was he would have loved to to have done Hellboy three, but again, just the money wasn't. Oh there. man, Hellboy Hellboy three is just that's a painful like yeah. situation, honestly. And the, the moment they did that reboot, it was like that was the nail in the coffin. It was like, oh never god, do it. I felt so bad for both Del Toro and Ron Perlman when they did that reboot. <laughs> yeah. Like the last time Ron Perlman put on the makeup was actually a really nice story. There was a kid who had a Make a Wish Foundation thing, so he put on the makeup and he saw the, and he saw the kid. You know, it was like the last time he put on the makeup. I think I remember hearing about this. Yeah, really sweet, really nice. Uh huh. All right. Okay. Uh, Kogias says it made a hundred million and had a sixty-five million dollar budget. <laughs> Yeah, so Kokios, like Dragon said, Dragon specifically used the wording, uh, it made just enough to justify yeah. a sequel. It was very much like on the bubble of making enough. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, if you can't, like, you know, like with the whole marketing, you have to guesstimate there's like a 20, like a 10 or 20 million dollar kind of like, you know, marketing kind of bubble there. So if you, I don't know, right. like basically look at it, just made its money back or maybe a hair over if you, if you split like the, the 20 million in half, but you know. Okay, so let's get into it. Yes. When can so, we shit talk John Myers? We'll just let's talk. About, <laughs> we'll, get to, we'll, we'll make. When do we Myers, get to that part of the podcast? We'll right? get to Myers. Is the same. <laughs> I want to talk about the big, the most Mignola part of the movie. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. The the opening is very cool. Let's talk about. So that's it. So the of, again of the Del Toro Mignola fusion collab kind of spirit we have going on in this whole movie. The most like hands down like fully adapted Mike Mignola kind of section of the entire film is recapturing the origin of Hellboy's the whole World War II opening. All of that's pure Mignola. Uh-huh. Which is great. Totally, you know, totally. It's all dark and rainy, and you have, like... I, I love the logic here. So Mignola, like, most of his stuff, he likes, like, the historical kind of backdrop of it. So it's the idea, okay, so in real life, you know, Hitler did have, like, a, an interest in the occult, which, you know, like, through, you know, the MC, you know, the Marvel and stuff with the Hydra, we do kind of explore. It. What if he did have, like, what if he took the interest a little more practical? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And we do that here, like, full on. Like, you know, Hitler had an interest in the occult versus just, like, okay, the name of the Hydra. Like, no, he's full on going the occult. So, like, all, all the. No, like, yeah. And the thing cool. is, like, like, this movie basically has a literal interpretation of a Hydra. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so we have this. Um, so the Nazis interested in the occult basically for like the superpower that would contend or fill in or compete with the bomb, essentially, uh, is a hell portal in this case. They build a hell portal. Uh huh. Which is pretty cool. I, my favorite thing about this is Del Toro is a gadget guy after my own heart. He, he loves, you know, he does this sort of stuff here because he, he has a he has a gear fetish, as he's called it. Um, which is why later on we have like all the you know the giant cogs and everything. Oh, oh my God! Yeah, Golden Army is like chock yeah. full of that shit. <laughs> That's, I mean, we even see, we kind of see it. Remember, like the way he takes a crone and as he throws, like you know, they, you know, this one's for you, Pinhead. He's like tosses like, the yeah. hog on him. So th there's even a little bit of it here. Right, right. But the, the fact is, just, I love the idea that we're connecting Act One and Three visually here. Like, I like the straight line that we paint here. Okay, they're opening a portal, and the bad guys trying to open the portal later through different means. So in the first means, it's like. How do we do it through technology? So he builds like the mechanical right hand of doom to open basically a tech, a, a portal made this giant like gy gyro, uh, gyroscopic sort of thing to open uh -huh. portal. So I, I, I just love the idea. That this is what we've achieved through like Nazi, you know, Nazi technology versus like the actual like, you know, like you know, ceremonial relics and stuff. I, I always thought that was really cool. 
totally. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Uh, the also so the big Lacraftian kind of behemoth thing. That's kind of our symbol for the end times. We have to do all these really cool little touches. Like we see, like the little uh, remember, like the little light that goes against the eye of this thing, just to demonstrate the scale. Like when the portal opens, just like that mm. giant, like it's like a giant crystallized thing. And you know, a lot of interesting parallels too to. Uh, the doom that came to Gotham. Mignol is obsessed with like Lovecraft and the whole idea like the end of the world. He is convinced the end of the world per Lovecraft is going to be a giant Cthulhu monster. <laughs> God. I mean, low key, honestly, Dragon, at the point that like where society is, I kind of welcome that, honestly, because <laughs> it feels like humanity is just going to eat each other. <laughs> so it's like, you know what? Why not? Let's bring on the Cthulhu. But I mean, like seriously, we can kind of call it out, uh, like the 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 O Jihad thing. It's oh, it's, it's always hard to pronounce the name of the actual Lovecraftian behemoth, but the something the O Jihad thing. This this thing, basically, the whole gimmick here, and we saw this, the, we saw this full on adapted. Like we saw what actually happens should this thing be successful in the Doom that came to Gotham, where it's okay if this thing gets unleashed. You know the whole the the world ends in fire and then is reborn. That's essentially what the the myth, the actual Lovecraftian mythos is that we that we there's associated with this thing. Only difference is here, uh, it's going to take a little red guy to to unlock the door. Right, right. <laughs> so again, we have rain, we have atmosphere, all this. Uh, uh, Professor Broom and then the GIs. You know, it's really that that's really cool too. Like the whole like we have so much like personality. And you, you you already kind of like Professor Broom. Like in the opening here, he's like the guy saying, "Oh yeah, we're not going to find anything, just sheep." Yeah. So yeah, with Broom, I definitely have a soft spot for John Hurt. I think John Hurt is like one of the godfathers of geek media for all the stuff he was in in the eighties. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. He really kills it in this movie. Dragon, what I will say about the role of Broom in this movie is that he is everything that the love triangle isn't. Because yeah. one of the things that I uh that I that I kind of saw with the making of is that Del Toro he was really focused on fleshing out the relationship with Liz, and he was really focused with fleshing out the father-son thing with Broom. The Liz stuff works really well in Golden Army. But I hear it's just okay. I like Liz as a character, but again, we got a whole other character involved that we'll talk about. It but uh, yeah, the broom stuff is just great. And the father-son stuff, I feel like, uh, I don't know, Dragon, I feel like father-son stuff, it's not necessarily like a huge part of uh, Del Toro's themes like it is for Spielberg, but it pops up from time to time, I want to say. The really, the really interesting thing um, with the father son thing is again, like the few elements of the movie that were like very much like kind of in violation of like how the comic of the original story was. Again, this is like the Del Toro kind of collab kind of emphasis where you know the relationship was not in the comic, as you know. Um, the father son angle actually wasn't really in the comic. He technically adopted right. him, but they never really in the comic. Broom gets killed off like rad, really early in the story. It's like kind of right, building right, the mystery yeah. of the thrill. He says, "Son, I have to tell you something." Then pff, dead. That's essentially how it goes there. Where you know we we develop a lot more here. But with all that, I really love looking back on the movie. Is you know, Broom finds the baby Hellboy. We have the baby Ruth and everything, which is always really great. That like even in adulthood, he loves the baby Ruth. <laughs> Did you, so you mean that was it? Was that in the comic? I don't. Here's the. I forget if it. I, it, no, it actually, really no, feels no. like really good product placement, right? He, that's the thing. No, the candy bar was an idea for the movie. It was not in the comic. Okay. Yes, Dragon. Let me just say the mystery movie that I have for memoirs. Right. Yeah. That's got some really bladed pl product placement in it. Okay. Let's just say that. We'll, we'll get there when we get there. <laughs> anyway, uh, we have um, Butali in the comments saying this movie introduced me to Ron Perlman and Del Toro. Yeah, uh, yeah Butali, uh, same here. I mean, yeah. technically I did see uh, Blade 2 first, but, um, but this movie definitely I took note of the names of both of them after this movie. <laughs> Del Toro, this was my first Del Toro film. Not my first Ron Perlman, because that's the animated series. And, uh, well, he has probably Teen Titans at this point as well. So he had, you know, he had uh, Clayface and Slade in this. Uh-huh. Anyway. Um, but anyway, yeah, so the... 
Yeah, so Babe Ruth was like Del Toro picked the candy bar. So like there was I don't I don't know if there was I forget if there was a, I don't think there was a candy bar in the original. Account. I think he just like hopped down to his arms or something. But uh, yeah, so the the idea that uh, you know there's really nice moment. It's a boy, and you know they hence the whole Hellboy thing. It's a boy. They 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 you know he adopts this Catholic this Catholic paranormal guy. He he adopts a child, and there are a lot of parallels to Superman with with Hellboy. Interestingly enough, because <laughs> think about it, you know he's raised Hellboy as his own. Knowing, uh, you know, knowing what he is. No, you're right. Yeah, Broom is very much a Pac Kent figure for sure. Yeah, he's the Pac Kent, and basically, what Del Toro is operating on this whole genesis for this film, like the core story, why he leaned on the father son thing, is like for basically the, the third act, where it's like you have you have Pa Kent versus basically a, kind of an evil drill in in Rasputin. Rasputin's essentially evil drill. Sure, sure. Think about it. He brought him into the world. He opened that portal. He gave, you know, he's essentially, he brings him, you know, he brings him through. So in a sense, you know, he delivered him. He delivered the baby. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, he's responsible for him. And he's tasked with, like, you know, ushering, making sure he fulfills his destiny, where the other one's trying to combat that destiny. Like, you know, you don't need to be what you were destined to be. There's, like, again, yeah, a little you know, a little bit of Iron Giant in there, too. Like, you know, you are who you choose to be. Right. But uh, but yeah, so it's 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 kind of a it's compelling and also kind of a meta father son story with the whole you know Mignola of it all there too, which is I don't know I think I, I think it's like something that Mignola never really consciously thought about, but I think it was like deep down it might have been there, and I think Del Toro like you know kind of nurtured that seed of destruction <laughs> into into what it was, and it was really cool. Now, one of the other things that I really appreciate about this movie, and this has kind of become a cliche over the years. But I think this movie was one of the first to really do it and do it well is the use of like real world comic books as like a real building device. Mm -hmm. I really like the use of that in this movie in particular. I think this movie, even though it has kind of almost become a trope, this movie is still one of the best uses of that. And that uh, so the the in universe comic, which again we're doing it before the you know before Captain America the first Avenger, so way before uh, Cap, yeah, way before Cap. Also, however, a little connective tissue there. Again, the comic is done in the style of Jack Kirby as a nod to again Mignola has a big influence of Jack Kirby in his work, so you know a little bit of a nice little nod. Uh huh. Anyway. But uh, yeah, so uh, you know, we Hellboys get, again. Another kind of change they made from the comic is in the second movie we exposed the B, the BPRD and Hellboy is like a real thing. But the whole idea of Hellboy kind of being a secret, like you know, that was something they added for the movie here, which I think was a good choice. You know, I don't know. I like the idea of the urban legend of like the Hellboy thing. I don't think it's kind of a neat idea. I like it. It's a it's a little Ninja Turtles. It's a little Ninja Turtles. Yeah, it only lasts for a movie, like one movie though. So. <laughs> right. Plus, right. I mean, he already, he's already like wearing the trench coat. What's the difference? You know, it's just... I, I think it fits the vibe of the uh, of the universe pretty well. Plus, he's not really hiding. They're trying to hide him, so That's it's not true. really. Yeah, you know... yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, so again, the whole hero versus destiny thing. You know, we we, we kind of cut to today. Um, well, quick little short, quick little story. I want to tell you. This is always really funny. Uh, so in the comic, uh, Hellboy, there was like this big crib in like in the comic that looked a lot looked a lot better in like Mignola style, where they had, like, the old soldiers had like get ladders to climb the thing. Uh huh. Um, Mignola realized, oh god, he can't adapt that. That's gonna be that's gonna look ridiculous in live action. So he had oh to. <laughs> so Mignola had to basically the the way the story goes. He bribed Del Toro. To not put that scene, not put the crib in the movie. What he did was, he gave him original comic pages of like one of the one of the best Hellboy stories, the corpse of like the original pages of the which we adapt later. The whole thing was carrying the corpse, like it was a, from the comics. So he basically gave him some original comic pages, and that was the agreement. Okay, we won't do the crib. You know what's funny is that nowadays I feel like comic book movies have evolved to a point where the crib would be like a selling point. Like yep. the squid was for HBO Watchmen. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's exactly it. Okay. So we link up and we have then we get to modern day and we have John Myers. So let's let's talk about him. Oh boy. <laughs> okay, can we can, just, should we like, talk about the good stuff with Myers before we you know Okay. Okay, so here right, let's move on. Oh come on. I'm sorry you set me up for that one. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Dragon, I this guy just he is like he is literally like a fucking dead weight to the whole movie, man. I'm sorry. 
look, there are, there are two things of benefit. There are two beneficial things we get from this character. Okay. So making him the POV character does help introduce the, you don't, the thing with that is that you don't need a POV character. It's one of those things where, like we were just talking about, this movie was afraid to embrace its own weirdness. And yes, that was probably a studio thing, but still. I don't, well, <laughs> even studio or not, honestly, I don't think that how, Here's the thing. I, I cannot, for life me, can I can't tell how much because again, the movie getting it made and waiting as long as they did to get it made it does make me wonder how much autonomy did they have. And I do wonder. It, it does feel very studio noty that we need a POV character and we need we need a love crime. Those do feel like the studio notes for the movie, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. However, I do see, I do see an argument for the POV character only in the sense that studio note or not, Hellboy is is a, is an out there concept for the time. And it does feel like if we're gonna have a, if we know Professor Broom is not gonna be around for the whole movie, and we might need someone to help kind of like again, assuming we had no love triangle, let's just say hypothetically, if we had no love triangle, we'd have a POV character that Broom is, is kind of grooming to you know kind of like look after him. And Hellboy does have handlers, so there's kind of a natural built-in thing there. Okay, so right there, Dragon, that right right there, what you just said, Agent Clay. Much better character. Yes, but Hellboy likes him, though. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and I like the dynamic. And it's I, I kind of feel like... The thing is, honestly, there's a scene in the movie where Myers is literally like, but Hellboy likes Agent Clay a lot more than, I, than he likes me. And I'm like, okay, so why isn't Agent Clay... The, the guy who's taking on the mantle of being, you know what I mean? Like, why is it that Clay's position? I, I, I see your point. I do also like Clay. I want to make that clear. I love that hair. Clay voice. feels like prototypical happy or prototype happy Hogan, and I love it. <laughs> I, mean, I, I really do love that gag where, like, it was the way Perlman delivers it the whole, like, when you have Clay, like, say, seriously, is it too much? Is it noticeable? Like, no, I was actually thinking about doing it myself. <laughs> right, you know, right. always being nice to the guy, and then he's like, You know, we have a man down, he cares about the guy. Look, that's great, but here's the thing, T. What they're going for, what I can see they're going for is they're going for like the young broom that we saw at the opening. They're going for we have a guy who's seemingly completely out of his element, like broom was. That's kind of what we're going for there. And again, at least in concept, I can respect what they were going for. I could see that potentially working because I like Meyer's role in the climax where he reminds him when he tosses him a little across, like that. That's his one. Basically, we, he, the only reason he's in this movie is for that scene. I'll, I'll, I'm completely cocked to that. It's the only <laughs> reason he's in that movie is to toss him that cross. Uh huh. I don't know. And you know, it's, we need someone for Hellboy to save a little bit, who's going to be not like a tough guy agent. That's that's the main reason. He, that's I can understand that for why he's in the movie. But you're you right. know, why else I don't like him. Why Myers? Because the actor is just very, very unremarkable. Uh, he feels like, like kind of like a Diet Coke version of Joseph Gordon Levitt. Wow, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's it, it's what I felt when I was watching. Poor, poor Rupert Evans just is like crying his eyes out. <laughs> Dragon, name one other memorable thing that this dude has been in. Well, here's the thing, Tiki. <laughs> Tiki, seriously, when I was growing up. I always had this thing where I kept there were two. There's two actors and they have very similar names. You have Rupert Evans and Rupert Everett. Okay, if Rupert <laughs> Everett was this guy, it would be a different story. I like I Rupert. Know. I know. I like Rupert <laughs> Everett too. I'm just saying because of that, I've always second guessed every time I've seen Rupert Evans. <laughs> I had that built into me, so I, 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 I think you're probably right. He hasn't done anything super remarkable, but I can never say with all. Oh God. Oh God, Dragon! I have a I have an even more scathing um comparison than Joseph Gordon Levitt. Are you ready? Ugh. He's like the poor man's Josh Hartnett. Oh, that's mean. <laughs> I mean Josh Hartnett wants to be Josh Hartnett. Come on. <laughs> okay, come on. Josh Hartnett's having kind of having a moment with Oppenheimer a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> okay, anyway, um. Let's see. Okay, well, regardless, again, remarkable or unremarkable as as he as as he may be, is the fact the matter. You know is, what, I, Dragon? I will give him one thing. Okay, I will give him one fucking thing. All right. 
What? I do like that he took it upon himself to see the humanity in Liz and reach out to her. Yeah. Now, that being said, that obviously leads to the most uh, yes. problematic area of the whole movie. But mm -hmm. initially, I thought it was nice that he took the initiative. Yeah. But th that's what I'm saying, Tika. This guy <laughs> does, in scenes, he can work, okay? Like, when he's, like, during the action where Hellboy has to save this guy, and he's like, you know, like, uh, no one helps me. Like, that works, okay? Because that's, there's a guy at it, like, this is the average Joe in the audience, like, wondering, the, you know, it's, it's, it's the old kind of, like, Robin to the Batman thing. If I can't be Batman, I can be the guy that helps him. You know, I could. <laughs> but again, we'd be completely out of our element, though. We'd be goners. Right, you have some right. funny exchanges. Like, what's that on your arm? Oh, right. Oh, crap. <laughs> it's like, <dang. laughs> like something like that. That there's a good chemistry there. And the idea that over time, this guy kind of, you know, he kind of grows to tolerate or like this guy by the third act. Like, there's that. And he helps Liz out, which would ingratiate him to help. Boy, problem is, <laughs> takes her out to coffee is <laughs> one thing. What? Then he's doing the arm move. He doesn't need to do that arm move. No, he that doesn't need to do tank. the fucking arm move. Are you he does. Me? Uh, here's the thing. That's Tiggy, that's the moment when he dies. That's the subplot, and that character's potential <laughs> dies the yep. moment he does that yep. arm thing. Seriously, it's like he's taking around for coffee and hellboy missing to help. No, he yeah, here's coffee. the fucked up thing. Like, yeah, like you just said, even on that, even in that scene, initially, before the arm move, he's genuinely, like, he's trying to play fucking matchmaker for Hellboy. Yeah. So, like, legitimately, the arm move makes no fucking sense. It literally feels out of character. I mean, the idea that, okay, Hellboy <laughs> gets, a little, gets a little childishly jealous, but again, if it were supposed, it, it, the way it should be is that it's completely unfounded, he's just he's jumping the gun on that. But the moment that arm happens, <laughs> the moment he does like the yawn. Oh my god! Like the idea of like she took I his love picture. How heated we're getting over like such an inconsequential little moment. But that's the thing. Like the moment he like does like the like for example, Hellboy's runner of like she took his picture. That's funny. That's great. It's like, he's not really being threatened, but he thinks he feels right. Threatened. Right. That yeah. Works. Yeah. But the arm is when he dies. <laughs> Also, Kogias is just pointing out, uh, John, Liz, is this a Hellboy movie or a Garfield movie? Well, Hellboy does like cats. Are we getting a new Hellboy film, Little Blue? Are we? I, I heard is that happening? I, I heard there was another reboot in development. I don't know if people were talking about the game, but, you know, because there is a new game out. I don't know. I, I It sounds like they're, they're trying to do a new movie, and just, it feels like they're never going to learn, because why could... Even if he's older, why can't we just do Hellboy 3? Why can't we just do it now? <laughs> yeah. Um, I would even take, like, an animated Hellboy movie voiced by Ron Perlman. Well, well, we do have two of those, Stinky. Oh, do we? Really? Yeah, we have two. And the Tad, the, the Tad Stones, the guy who did uh, you know, Darkwing Duck, did them. Oh shit! Oh, I have to check yeah. those out. I mean, they're yeah. they're pretty good, honestly. I mean, yeah. there's not they, they also you're gonna love. There's no romance in it. They took out the main more comic book, like they took out the Wait, romance. Hellboy the Crooked Man. Hold, okay, I'm I'm literally looking this. Okay, out. so the Crooked Man, it sounds like is the it's what the new movie is going to be called. But uh, the animated movies, there's a uh, Blood and Iron, and then there's uh, I think it's the director Sword Brian Sword Taylor. Sword what has Brian Taylor done? Oh God. Okay. <laughs> oh, this is a very Dragon, we're talking about the guy who did Crank and the second Ghost Rider movie, mm. which both of those movies are a lot of fun, right? Like, they're very high-energy, high-octane action movies that are kind of insane, but um, not exactly the type of, uh, and I don't know who's playing Hellboy. Who's playing Hellboy? Oh, dear God. I, I don't know who's playing Hellboy either, honestly. I didn't hear anything about that. Uh, Jack Cassie. I don't even know who. I don't even know who that is. <laughs> uh, apparently, he was a lead on the strain. From well, he was Del Toro worked on, so it's kind of probably really good okay. Play. That makes sense. Oh wait, wait, wait. Hold on, hold on. Um, he played Black Tom Cassidy. In oh, I know him. Yeah, yeah, that's him. Yeah, I hear. I recognize the name, but I, think <laughs> I don't know. If, yeah, that, yeah, that's him. All right, there you go. I do not there see him as Hellboy at all. <laughs> I know this seriously, like this flew completely under my Why? radar, guys. When will <laughs> they learn? <laughs> but Dragon, we need another fucking Ghostbusters movie too. God. 
Anyway, All right. <laughs> regardless, but honestly, though, the, that game they put out recently was like really impressive. You should look into that game they put out recently. It's, it's not even talking about like the old game that is like they did once. Uh, action, like, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just depressed about what became of that Suicide Squad game, though, man. That shit's depressing. Okay, anyway. All right. <laughs> I'm playing I'm playing through that depression right now, by the way. Is it is it bad? Ah, uh, well... Or, because the thing is, I don't know. Like, a lot of times with games, the media kind of overblows it, so... Well, I mean, I just started it, so I'm not really far enough into, I think, have an informed opinion, but it's, uh... Not great. Not rosy, quite yet. I, I don't know. I, 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 I like the chemistry of the team, but I don't know. Well, I, I, I'm too early. I'm on, like, the first mission, like, the first level. I don't, you know... Uh. Anyway, Gogias, I have not seen Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, but it has been a long standing thing with me and Dragon that I am not a Ghostbusters guy. I really, out of most of the Hollywood franchises, it's one of the ones that I give the least shit about, honestly. Anyway, so, point to <laughs> you watch the animated Hellboy movies. Okay, fair enough. Secondly, uh, again, getting back on them. Uh, Get back and point So I want to mention too when when uh, we have the big introduction of like we threw up the comic and everything, and then we reveal Hellboy for the first time live and in person. Here's Tiki in 20 years. I never noticed this until this recent watch, and it blew my mind. Okay. Okay. So when we reveal Hellboy initially, he is wearing shorts, <laughs> like, he, like he is wont to do in the comics. Now here's the thing that blew my mind. Okay. Because they were worried, I assume because they were worried about how it would look. And it's the only time ever in the whole, in both movies, he wears shorts, mm -hmm. like he does in the comics. If you look, and the, it's out of focus intentionally. If you look and you pause, you see they gave him the tiny little legs he has in the comics. It's crazy. Nice, nice. Yeah, and like hooves, like he doesn't have like you know, he has like little tiny right, little right, legs yeah. and hooves. But I never in a million because again, so I'm, I'm looking at, on the upper body because he's like in shadow and everything. It looks awesome. The mm -hmm. smoke coming out early, but oh my god, I was my mind was completely blown. They did the little legs. They didn't do it at all because it would have looked ridiculous afterwards. Or, 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 that that is one thing that would have absolutely looked ridiculous. No, but question. that's the thing. I, I I was really impressed. They found a way to work it in. There was like a little <laughs> like, one time. It's like it's there. So they did it, and we never see him without the pants on. So it's right, like, yeah, right. it's cool. All right. Anyway, makes no sense how he can work those boots, but it's it, it's great. Yeah, so Mutali's on my side about Ghostbusters, Little Blue, and Kogios. It's a burning hot take. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, Mutali, like, I think the first one's, like, all right. Like, it's it's far from my favorite 80s Bill Murray movie. I'll say that much. It's 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 all right. It is what it is. It's it's fine. But I don't know. It's, it's one of those things where it's, like, just the fact that it's so popular kind of turns me off of it even more. I'm very hipsterish about Ghostbusters in that way. Anyways. Anyway. So, uh, you know, we have the music, you know, like, uh, you know, I like the day in a life thing with Hellboy, where you have, like, the action sequence at the museum, which is a great introduction for him. It's the fantastic and the mundane, you know, he had, goes in without a real plan. He's just trying to negotiate with Sam, the Sam I.L. saying, look, can we just not do this? I mean, I'm a bad shot, but these are really big bullets. As he pulls out one of the coolest guns ever, the Samaritan, which is this giant gun. Mm -hmm. Looks awesome. I, one thing I will say, and this isn't really a critique, it's just kind of something I noticed, is that uh, uh, Hellboy's dialogue in this movie is almost like proto-MCU, where it's like, he, he is very quippy in this movie. Yeah, but again, it's a natural blue-collar quip. quip sure, sure. Like, uh, again, I'm not trying to make a critique out of that. I, I actually think it's kind of like a, a plus to the character, but it's... It's almost kind of like a good kind of like, you know, the MCU before every character started being quippy like that, you know? Hey, Tiki, Tiki, think about this. So this movie comes out in 04, same year Spider-Man 2 comes out, okay? Mm -hmm. and the, the Raimi Spider-Man films always struggle with quippage. Oh, yes. It's the fact that we have Hellboy doing this. I feel like all the, all the quips in the Raimi Spider-Man films are like ironic meme quips. Here's your change is cute, though. <laughs> yeah, that's cute. But that's something Spider Man would change. Be. Pizza time. There's a few. There's a few. But pizza time doesn't count because that's Peter Parker. Doesn't. I know. I know. <laughs> but, you know like, pizza time became a meme, but you know the, the like he should change. Time, like though. that's actually that's a good Spider Man line. Him throwing a bag of like you. Know, that's like the one there. good one. That's like the one really solid one. <laughs> that and I think honestly, just all the clip it's in that scene for because he has that and he has like you have a knack for that. Uh -huh. you know, it kind of kind of works anyway. <laughs> 
So let's not gush about Spider Man Two. We're going to be here all day. <laughs> Fact We've is, we've already done a podcast on that, right? Like, it, we can't do another Spider Man Two podcast. I mean, Tiki, I think we did, but we might want to check. I'm pretty sure we did all the Spider Man movies leading up to No Way Home. I'm I believe sure that's what the deal was. Yeah, I think so. I'll Let's check just to make sure, but <laughs> sure. Okay, anyway, so, um, again, so, you know, day in a life mission sort of thing. Also, we, st- we got to talk about Abe Sapien. Oh, my God. How have we, how have we gone? Well, because you wanted in... to get into the whole love triangle. Okay, you're right. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I, 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 I genuinely feel bad about Abe Sapien now. Abe yeah. Sapien is awesome. Of course, Doug, Doug Jones playing uh, Abe Sapien. Now, in the sequel, Doug Jones both plays him physically and does the voice. Mm-hmm. And it's fun. It's a funny story how this happened. Now, this actually was the studio's meddling. Okay, so as much as Tiki and I are strong advocates... This is going to be like one of the few times where we have to say anything bad about fucking... About David Hyde Pierce. I almost called him Neil Patrick Harris. Oh, you mother... (laughs) How they're wrong three names. I know, I know. (laughs) How dare you? He's our mascot for peace. He pretty much is at this point. We can't talk about Black History Month without talking about David Hyde Pierce. (laughs) I mean, low key, yes, you are absolutely correct about that. <laughs> Shame. <laughs> right. Go to the corner, anyway. So, uh, uh, little blue that. says he checked, and we already did do a uh, Spider-Man two podcast. Yep. Uh, I would, I wouldn't be opposed to Catwoman. How you feel about Catwoman, Dragon? We're gonna move on from there. So. <laughs> I would do it. I would fucking do you're, Catwoman. You're out man. of your mind if you want to talk about Catwoman. I will, uh, Dragon. I, I, <laughs> Catwoman is a lot of fun. It's a so bad it's good movie. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might have to have patience on that one. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, anyways, well, here's what I was getting at. So, Speak for yourself, though. Here's the thing. So, David Hyde Pierce, I'm going to give you, like, even though it's a, it's a thing where we, we don't need David Hyde Pierce in this film, but he is, he does sound like the character again. So, so pointlessly, though, so does Doug Jones. Doug Jones and you Neil, know, uh, Doug Jones feels like Abe Sapien. You know, he feels mm-hmm. like that character embodies him and it matches with the movements. Great. But David Hyde Pierce. Also, you know, has a sound that sounds just like that character. He's got a nice regal voice, an intellectual voice, and he also feels like he would fit that fish guy. And it's a shame because everyone going to that movie is going to think, oh, David I. Pierce might be in the suit, at least to the average Joe audience member in 2004. They might think, oh, yeah, maybe he's in that costume. He's doing something or it's just purely a voice without thinking about all the super forming that's going in there. And here's the thing. David I. Pierce, the studio brought him in because they wanted name talent on this movie as much as they could squeeze in, knowing they lost the battle on Ron Perlman. So they get Dave, they get David Hyde Pierce. David Hyde Pierce went to do the recording, but he heard the audio that that Doug Jones, which essentially sounds like what you would get in Golden Army. That's how Ape Sapien sounds. Right. And he says, "Well, y- you don't need me. You already have an outfit." <laughs> I get, that honestly sounds like a fucking like sitcom setup where it's like, w- w- "What's going on here? Why am I? Why am I replacing a perfectly legitimate actor?" And David I. Pierce, such such a darling. He would he would mention like when he's doing interviews on on the you know the red carpet, he would highlight Doug Jones and say, "Oh, he's, he's wonderful in the role." And that they really ultimately he would say, oh, God, really, Cat, they don't... Cokey also saying Catwoman's an underrated film." <laughs> All right, anyway, Cokey, you do you. <laughs> the point being, you know, he's so so. Uh, you know, David I. Pierce, like during interviews and stuff, he's like saying, "Oh no, listen, the Doug Jones, they really didn't need me on this, but Doug Jones is wonderful." So again, very, very nice. He didn't need to do that, but he did. That's really sure. sweet. But uh, yes, in regards, Abe Saban is very much a prototype for uh, the Gill Man in the Shape of Water for Del Toro, as we can kind of tell there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No question. <laughs> you know, he's great. You know, but again, I like that Abe is very separate from the Gill Man. You know, Gill Man's essentially more creature from the Black Lagoon, where Abe Sapien, you know, he's very much kind of this cool, uh, you know, this basically. In the comic, almost Abe Sapien, he does not have like the mental, you know, the psychic ability like he does here. He's an intellectual. Uh, he's pretty much there for like window dressing. Like when you come in, you have a fish guy, and sometimes he can walk on land. But here we we make him real useful, you know, or he can he can you know, he's he's a contemporary for Professor Broom. Like Hellboy, he was found and kind of taken in by Professor Broom. So in a sense. They're kind of, there's kind of a brotherly thing there that's kind of under, it's underneath it all, I like the thing, kind of fitting into what you were saying earlier about Ron Perlman and Doug Jones being kind of brothers in makeup. Sure, 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 yeah. 
But uh, but yeah, I mean, I I, I that's the I never really thought of it that way until going back to it. This view is like, yeah, there is kind of like there is like they do. Hellboy does have a respect and a kingship with with Abe. It's usually because they're buddies. But if you think about it, and you look at Hellboy too, especially when they're bonding when drunk, it's just the fact that yeah, that there is there might be a bit of a, a fraternal kind of brotherly kind of thing there because he calls him red, he calls him blue. You know, it's their nickname mm-hmm. for each other. And you know, I don't know. I, that's that's my head canton on. At least I like to think. I also just really like, uh, I'm not sure if this is in the comics or not, but I really love how Abe got his name in the movie. I believe that's from the comic. I think uh-huh. there's like a Lincoln thing. They might have actually shown a little bit more of the Lincoln thing. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny because we actually saw Lincoln in like one of Neil's other stories with the amazing screw on head. Oh, really? That's funny. Did you ever see that pilot? The amazing screw on head. I don't. Yeah, Giamatti's in it. Really? Oh, he, man. He, he plays Screw on Head. <laughs> and Corey Burton plays Lincoln. Oh, jeez. And Pat, Pat Oswalt is the butler, and David High Pierce is, is the bad guy. <laughs> oh, God. Crazy. It's insanity. That does sound pretty insane. Yeah. Anyway. So, uh, okay, so I guess we're moving on from there. Uh, so Hellboy sneaks off. Uh, you know, like the whole thing is like he's like a bad kid sneaking out after curfew. Uh-huh. And I like the Halloween setting, by the way. I thought that was a good choice. All right, so point being... Uh, no, that was a good choice. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I, I, I honestly kind of wish this movie would have leaned into that a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, we kind of the, the closest we got to it was uh, you know Myers just saying, "Oh, heck of a Halloween costume, right?" Huh? <laughs> Which honestly is like one of the very few genuinely entertaining Myers moments. All right, so again, we've already established what we don't like about the love triangle. Okay, it's just this. It's, it's the, Dre, love... the thing about the love triangle again is that it just it, it takes up way way too much screen time. And that's bigger, what really fucking bugs me about it. The bigger issue is, as much as I love the scene that is coupled, uh, that, that is coupled with, uh, I, I, as much as I love Hellboy spying on on Liz and Myers, just from a standpoint of like him on the rooftop buddying with the kid. I love him and the kid on the rooftop, and just him spying Which, on. By him the, the way, kid. the kid also kind of feels like another proto MCU thing. It's like it's like one scene. <laughs> I, I know, I'm just saying, it's like, oh, this is another concept that the MCU is going to adapt. <laughs> no, for sure. <laughs> I don't know, Dragon, that's the thing, that's one of my takeaways about re-watching this movie, is just how much MCU DNA is in this movie, honestly. Yeah. But, uh, but yes, yeah, so as much as I love that, as much as I love that part of it, um, it does feel really choppy that we go from, okay, look, at least the beginning of the whole thing with the kid, then love triangle, but we go from love triangle to brooms dead. Mm-hmm. Like that's, you know, it doesn't feel great. <laughs> and you know what? With, with the broom thing, I do think that the movie drags out him dying a little too much. I almost kind of feel like as good as the father son stuff is, I almost kind of feel like he dies a little almost a little too late in the movie, which is kind of a weird thing to say, but do you see what I mean? It, it's like the pacing is, the pacing just feels a little off. I Look, I'll meet you halfway. Just because, just I don't... because they're, they're constantly, like, every time Broom is talking to any character that isn't Hellboy, he's like, I'm dying and I don't want Hellboy to know. Yeah, It's like, okay, like, this is the most obvious Uncle Ben that we've ever had. But, yes, okay, look, it's it, less Uncle Ben, a little bit more like kind of like a Pa Ken or Jarrell. I don't know. I, in this case, more so Pa Ken. Well, I, I say Uncle analogy. Ben is just like a, I use Uncle Ben as basically like a uh, like a noun dragon to describe the character that you know is going to get killed off in the story. I, I here's what I would yes, but I don't. I think he. I think is the timing of his death is appropriate. I don't think. I don't think it's too late in the movie. I think. I think Broom dying when he dies again, basically by the end of Act Two, is very intentional. So we go, we're taking away all the safety nets for Hellboy for Act Three. We've we've set up that you know he is dying, but he doesn't really he doesn't expect to die in this way. And it kind of again we go from like the one father figure to again the one that brought him into this world that he's going to be kind of going up against with uh, Rasputin in, in, in that sense. I don't know. I I I like the point in which we were, we were moving, but I will uh, go with you this far. 
it does feel a little compacted because of the other stuff going on around it. So in that sense, we do right. cheat the screen time, but not with his death. I don't, I don't mind how, at all how we handle his death. No, I, I, I think his death is fine. Again, my main issue is just how much that they, uh, they kind of hammer home. Like, hey, guess what? He's dying. This character oh, this is a whole movie. dying. <laughs> this is a whole movie about prophecies, though, Tiki. It's a whole movie about, you know, like, Hellboy's going to bring about the end of the world. So the, with that, it's like, I don't know, it's like this guy knowing he's going to die and everyone, you know, like, like prognosticating that I feel is appropriate. So I don't think they don't have a problem with, like, you know, like the reminder of that. I mean, fair enough. I, I, I see what you're saying thematically. I just thought. As far as like just from a pure writing level, I felt like it was a little bit repetitive, but that's well, I mean, fair. They really only do it like two times. You know, he tell tell Abe finds out and then he tells Myers. So he Myers doesn't leave. <laughs> right. So you know. Well, anyway, right. uh so Liz so uh, Liz Sherman's of course Selma Blair, uh, you know, the the, the core relationship, this was important. This is a whole Del Toro thing as we've kind of established, but it was important to Del Toro Del Toro because if Hellboy is Mignola's father. And that's like a huge like touchstone for him in that story. Liz and Hellboy's relationship is Del Toro's tribute to his wife. And the relationship and the romance that he had with his wife. For example, the big scene, which was like the first time they shot with like, you know, the Hellboy chess, which was like a big thing. Oh, guys, are going to look good in the full makeup. Um, when Hellboy says, I promise you, I will always look this good. That's a, that's a line he said to his wife when he was courting her, you know, when they were in their dating. So there's a, that, that's very personal. So the core relationship I feel is strong and a nice addition to the movie again, before we get to the triangle, <laughs> but, you know, like inner separated from the triangle, the relationship's pretty good. Yeah, it is. It is. And, and, and also and again, again I feel of, like in the golden army, Liz is a very good character. So it's like, you know, I, I kind of feel like, and she does have stuff going for her. Like, I feel like Liz is probably, honestly, even in this movie, in spite of all the love triangle bullshit, she's probably the most sympathetic character out of anybody. Well, yeah, I mean, we see her, uh, you know, we, we see her her backstory, which is rather, rather tragic, you know, how she basically incinerated a bunch of bullies and everyone. <laughs> <laughs> right. But uh, that's the thing. Here's, honestly, it's some... It's somewhat of a missed opportunity, but I mean, it's kind of there thematically, but I understand, like, you know, we can only dedicate so much to it. But then again, if we cut up that love triangle, who knows? Just the, the idea that her power set and her origin with the destruction that she's capable of is kind of a causal link to Hellboy. And I think deep down, maybe thematically why they make a good pair, you know, the fact that he's he's prophesized to be the end of the world and she has the power that could like be that practically could be the end of the world, you know? Mm -hmm. So I really like that. Yeah, I get the you know, logic there, for sure. There's an element of kind of tragedy with it, within them and what their, their lots are in life. They kind of bring them together. All right, let's see. So I, I guess in terms of the plot overall and our bad guys here, so... Again, Rasputin's plot, again, again, Hellboy. I think Rasputin is like, he's a cool concept to have as a villain in a Hellboy movie. I just don't think this guy has a lot of screen presence. I like his design. I'll give him that much. I I, I agree with you there. Basically, Rasputin only has two, again, Rasputin's two big moments in this whole movie, really. You know, he's all aesthetic up to this point. Mm -hmm. Him killing, him killing Brune. Sorry, him killing uh, Broom. And then, of course, like the big, uh, you know, like the big Embrace Your Destiny scene by the third act. Those are really the only two key scenes that, that he really gets to shine as a character and what he believes in. Aside from that, it's like aesthetically, he's the guy with the cool glove at the, at the opening of the movie. He's opening the hell for us, you know? <laughs> right, right, yeah. So he is used very sparingly, but it, it's kind of a thing where... Like the concept of this character is great. The idea that so Hell, in the Hellboy comics, they love playing with historical and mythological things, like them being actual characters in the story. Like he is the actual uh, Grigory Rasputin, you know, like the. And like, Rasputin, you know, the end frankly, is one of the more fascinating <laughs> historical figures, honestly. And they acknowledge it, like in in dialogue in the top there, like yeah, he was castrated, killed, and everything. So like they 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 you know, this guy has like immortality kind of fix going on there, and the idea is like. He is immortal because he's made this deal with like the Cthulhu creature, where that's how he keeps coming back. And it, every time he keeps, he dies and he comes back more and more, of himself is like you know becomes what the Hellboy fights at the end of the movie. Uh huh. So I mean, the whole 
So the biblical pool, the pools and everything, like the whole angel tears and the Hydra nod, like when we kill Samael and two more take its place and everything. So these are like kind of cool, like the you know, Mignola kind of concepts that we're playing with here. But you're right. We do more with like a full on Del Toro villain, like Prince Nuada in Hellboy 2 than we do with this guy. But again, there's like more on the page, like thematically we can do with Nuada than we can with Rasputin. Rasputin is just important because he ties into the origin. He's the origin bad guy, you know? He's the, you know, he's, uh, you know, he's sure. the, the point of Genesis. But you're right. When you look back, every time I look back on the original Hellboy film, he, the villain was kind of the, like, the, in terms of the plot, I think now looking back on it 20 years later, I think I have a greater appreciation for it. But back when I watched it, it was like, I can't, I can't really follow what's going on, but I like the ride, you know? Mm -hmm. Where again, at its That's core, a good way to describe it, yeah. Like at its core, what I think I appreciate now, but even then, I could kind of gleam as like, okay, it's basically opening a door. That's essentially our main plot. We're opening a doorway. Guy uses it, uh, you know, with technology, and then uh, we use it with the stone and Hellboy's hand. That's that's all you really need to know at its core. But the problem is, Lovecraft is insanely hard to explain to people. And this guy's whole deal is like, what is like, what is he trying to like? We can barely even pronounce like the thing that's that's coming out of like the actual name of this. <laughs> right. See, that's the thing. Lovecraft is always tricky because of that. So because of that, the plot's always a little iffy versus it's clear as crystal in Hellboy 2. He's trying to awaken all the all the egg guys, he's trying to awaken the golden. <laughs> See, that's simple as can be. That's 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 that's, that's salient and clear as crystal. Uh huh. The main thing we have going on for Rasputin here is his, his henchman is awesome. We got to talk about Cronin. Sure, sure. So what do you think about Cronin, Diggy? I mean, he's okay. I on, honestly, Dragon. I got to be honest with you. I he's not as memorable to me as he is to you. Really? I mean, the, the whole like all the the, the the bladed billy clubs, and he's like he's like a surgery. Yeah, man, it's, again, it's aesthetics. It's aesthetics. I I remember the billy club thing more than I remember the actual character. Look, honestly, like, I'm not even saying as a character, as a cool aesthetic of a character. Yeah, as a right? cool aesthetic, sure. He's I, as a matter of fact, I would even wager to say he's a little cooler than Rasputin himself. Yeah, that's right. That's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like this, as, Cronin had all the stare power. There's just not a lot there to no, actually course, break but... down. Yeah, I don't know. It's just that that's thing. It's just basically it's Del Toro. The way they kind of describe it is that when design wise in the beginning, like in the very beginning when he's wearing the hat and everything, that's pure Mignola in the visual. The moment he moves, this is like the Credo one set. The moment he moves, turns into a Del Toro character. He's pure Del Toro. He has like the little clockwork piece in his chest which is always a heady idea for me the idea as a kid the whole surgery attic thing terrified me but by the same token it's so cool like he's i love the tactile gadgetry of it he turns the dial and he takes all the pain and dies and then he then he comes back sure sure i don't know it's just really cool anyway uh, let's see. So, you know, we have, uh, we have some you know, nice action scenes, like on the subway platform. He saves the kittens. Like, that's really nice. You know, him, Hellboy saving kittens, like the very core to the character. <laughs> it's a, in, in Italy, if we're comparing the two movies, you know, another shortcoming of the first film is we take Abe out of the equation for plot reasons. And, you know, it's like, we love Abe. It, it felt very much like they were kind of playing by Aquaman rules in 2004. There's only so much he can do. He's in the water. He can do all this stuff. But because of that, we have to take him out in the water. Yeah, I mean, like, again, this is kind of what I was worried about with this podcast. But, like, Golden Army definitely does a lot more with him. Yep. But still, like, you know, the idea, it's a really tense sequence, though, when he's in the water and then he loses, like, the little good luck charm and then he gets, you know, gashed and, like, a, a nearly killed by the, the Samuels. Mm. Yeah. But also, uh, fun fact, when they actually shot, Doug Jones is in the, when he's talking to Liz and everyone, he's actually in that, it's not like a dummy or anything, he's actually in the tank. Uh, you know, he and he's being, they, they hung him upside down, as Del Toro colorfully puts it. Uh, they hung... D Doug Jones upside down by his balls for his birthday. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> way, like Del Toro's all jovial about it. Like, Doug, we're gonna celebrate your birthday by hanging you upside down by your balls. That might be the most Guillermo Del Toro sentence I've ever heard. But yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> so when he's with that Rubik's Cube, which by the way was a Del Toro idea that even Abe Sapien cannot solve the Rubik's Cube. <laughs> uh-huh. So, yeah, so, uh, you know. 
All right. All right. Let's see. I'm trying to see what all the other major things we should probably uh, we should hit on here. Um, da, 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 da. Okay. So the the actual the, the actual death of Baroon, beautiful scene. Uh, again, just the father accepting his death, and it's almost like you know very Obi Wan Kenobi esque. Just the whole thing of like strike me down, I'll become more powerful, kind of kind of a thing here, where you know he it, it's a really I love the way Del Toro directs this scene. Just the, fact that the quiet scene. It's it's a scene where Rasputin's actually giving him mercy. It's a mercy killing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, where he says like, "I promise you, will be quick." Like it, it's like a, it's a thank you for you 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 raised the the end of the world and you've helped carry out my mission. I appreciate that. So that's honestly that's the best scene Rasputin really has in the whole movie. Just the conversation between the two father figures, like Jor El versus you know versus Pop. Yeah, versus, but you know, again, so. it's like low key. It's like the only big moment yeah. he has, honestly. Agreed. That's the issue. Yeah. No, you're right. But you can also like playing like the whole we'll meet again song as he like, you know, kind of like artfully kind of, kind of falls and it's, I don't know, all that's really, really well executed the, the, the scene there. Um, also clever planning on like using Cronin as like the Trojan horse to, to execute this too. I don't know. I thought that was good. Anyway. All right. So uh, we go to Moscow. Uh, how do you feel about the corpse? The puppet. I, I got to be honest with you. I don't even know what you're talking about. You know they get they, they you know they go to they go to Russia and they have to get directions to where Rasputin is. And they, they oh no, they okay, okay. I I'm so sorry. Yes, that is legitimately one of the most creative ideas in the whole movie. It feels totally like <laughs> it, it's totally Sam Raimi for one, which is great. Mm -hmm. And I wish that they would have done more with it. Honestly. Yeah, I mean that's that's the thing. They put the this was kind of like a must-have. If we're gonna do a Hellboy movie, and for all we know, we're only doing one of these, you have to have one of the most iconic pulls from the comic, which was this time where Hellboy re used a little magical charm to reanimate a corpse. And they have this fun dynamic where it's like they over there, Red Monkey, and just the fact that Hellboy can speak Russian, they say, This is Ivan, he's gonna take us where we need to go. Good. Uh, Little Blue says Del Toro voiced the corpse. Yep, That's Del Toro. Amazing. Del Toro is known for doing like the hacking cough, so he's, he's very much. <laughs> also, fun, better, even even deep, deeper cut of a fun fact here: the little charm that Hellboy uses to uh, resurrect uh, the corpse, Ivan. That's, that was actually fan made at a convention, like when they announced like the Hellboy movie or something. That like it was either that or a con leading up to the movie. So a fan made that little charm, which is modeled after the Batman Hellboy crossover. Nice, nice. That's yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's nice. Anyway, um, how how do we feel about Jeffrey Tambor? <laughs> I, I honestly, I don't really. He, he's one of those actors where he's fine, but I've never really seen him like he's never really blown me away in anything that he's done so for me he's just kind of like the less memorable agent character as opposed to clay honestly really you i'm sorry know. dragon I, I feel like i'm kind of dropping the ball on all these how do you feel about blanks but i don't know it's like the one of the one of the really great scenes with Jeffrey Tambor was that scene with the match where they kind of have a, he has a bonding moment with Hellboy. He's been on his case the whole movie and he kind of, they save each other. And then they have this moment of just kind of like a like cool guy acceptance where it's like, what are you doing? Don't, don't light the, don't light the cigar with a lighter. Use a wooden match. Help savor the flavor. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. It was always just kind of, it was a nice, very nice human little moment there between them. It always kind of stuck out. All right. Um, anyway, so again, we're in the you know in the third act. Uh, just a big moment of truth for Hellboy. Ultimately, you know, we have the whole Angnu Brahma thing where we see Hellboy with the giant horns and like the cool the flame crown and everything. Basically, Beast of the Apocalypse, literal Beast of the Apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, he's just you know he's. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, he's. So I'm just looking at comment here. Uh, uh, the little blue Jeffrey Tambor went from uh, coming face to face with the Muppets and then Hellboy. <laughs> yep. And we also have Warp Monarch in the comments, and yes, indeed, it is very disappointing that we won't get a uh, Hellboy trilogy. I mean, I did never say never. You know, legacy sequels are very possible these days. But then again, apparently, they're making this next. <laughs> honestly, Dragon. Honestly. 
what I just said, the whole legacy sequels are very popular these days, like that that is true. But now we have news of the second Hellboy remake, and I feel like that has killed yeah. the legacy sequel. <laughs> Doesn't it just like feel more so than the David Harbor version did? Like you can try something new once, but when you try something new twice, it's it's over. Doesn't it just <laughs> feel silly that if they just took the money that they've they've ex- expend that they've expended on two Hellboy most likely unsuccessful Hellboy reboots, and just uh, had done the third movie, it would have saved them so yeah. much trouble in the long run. It's like, <laughs> they don't have the money. So if you could just go back and say, guys, look, you're going to try and reboot them. They're not going to make money. No one's going to like them. Just give us the money. Let us make <laughs> the third one. It's going to save. It's going to. Make everyone a lot happier. Plus, there's like, like, it's not that they didn't have a story. They had like an ending planned and everything for the third one. Right. Del Toro, I mean, he's holding out hopes, but he's not, he's not revealed what, what the full story is there. You know, it's like, I want to know what happens. I want to know how it ends. <laughs> you know, anyway, so speaking of endings and everything here, again, this was always like a nice payoff and very much a big moment. Where, you know, Hellboy, after the cross burns in his hand, he has an opportunity to really see, like, are you going to be man or are you going to bring about the end of the world? Or are you going to, like, which father are you going to honor there? The, uh, the father that's the seizure potential, end the world, the father that's all your potential to save the world. And it's a really cool moment where he rips off the horns. And the whole reason that scene exists in the comic was just to show that's what those little stumps on, on his head are. Like, he actually has horns that he shaves down. So he breaks the horn off and he stabs or sputing with it. And this leads to a big old monster fight. You know, it's 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 a really cool, it's a really cool like, symbol. He's some, using the symbolic, sorry, using the symbol of his destiny that he rejects it. And it's a really cool visual way of doing that, I've always felt. Yeah, I do like that. Yeah. We pay off the faulty equipment. Me being the gadget guy, and there's like a running gag, the BPRD. They always have this technology that's constantly failing, so they use the grenades to take care of the monster finally, but he has to do it practically because the timer never works. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, yeah, basically we end on the, the, the now awkward flaming kiss because, like, there's Myers. He's, he's bearing witness to this. <laughs> <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah, again, Myers really didn't have to be a thing in this movie. Uh, again, I, I, I still maintain that if you needed a POV character, it very easily could have been Agent Clay. Yeah. <laughs> again, I want to say, in a version of this movie, we did not have the love triangle. Like, him taking a seat as, like, as like you know, like, Broom's fill-in and, like, watching the sun, like, you know, be happy... You know, there is a world in which that ending does land really well, you know? Mm-hmm. And at the bare minimum, it works, and that's nice that, you know, Hellboy, you know, admittedly, if you really look at the plot of the movie, it's like, yeah, Liz like sac- Liz was sacrificed, and then she comes back miraculously, we, but we do have a nice little line where it's a little ambiguous if Hellboy actually used his demonic cachet to, uh, you know, get her back, bring her soul back into her body. It's a nice gesture, all the same. It's a nice little romantic ending, but when you overthink it, it's like, yeah, and there's like a love trial, and now it's awkward because Myers is there, and it's like, you know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's like they well, move uh, past guys, the movie. I, I'm here too. Yeah, so it's you know it's the thing, and unfortunately we can't have Abe there because we, we can't have our fish man in the Arctic. <laughs> right, right. For him. So you know we kind of have to move certain pieces where they where they let things go where they lie, but you still. It's a nice, it's a nice, it's a, it's a win for Hellboy at the end. It's nice. Uh huh. Yeah. All right. Is that it? Yeah, that's that's it. I mean, we should. Hey, Greg, I got to be honest with you, man. This was a little bit of a struggle for me because, I, man, again, this movie is a really good prototype. It's a fine prototype, but it's it's got just too many issues with it that just get ironed out in the sequel. So what I was afraid was going to happen with this podcast ultimately happened, which is that I spent mostly the whole time being like, yeah, that's good, but it's, you know, it's better in golden army. So I don't know, man, I I feel bad about that. But at the end of the day, this is, this is one of those movies where it's like, I I respect it, but if I'm going to go back to it, I'm going to go back to Hellboy two way more. So, I don't know, man. I feel like I kind of dropped the ball on the commentary here. I just didn't have a lot to add here. I really didn't. I feel like this is a a perfectly fine movie. I think the most interesting thing about it, honestly, in a modern context, is kind of like the MCU blueprint stuff, if you really look at it through that lens. 
I don't know, man, but between Rasputin, between the John Myers stuff, the love triangle, it, it's frustrating because there's a lot of creativity here. There's a lot of creativity here, but it just get, gets weighed down. In the second movie, those weights are just gone, and Del Toro can just, like, let his freak flag fly very proudly in the second movie. So, yeah, I don't know. The, this is a movie where it's like, I respect it, but... Just, it's hard to go back to and really find passion for. And I I genuinely feel bad for how much passion you seem to have for it that I don't. So I apologize for that. That's, you know, it's okay. I mean, look, again, I, I agree with you. I like the second movie more. But I think the point, that what I'm getting trying to get across here is that it's interesting where we have... We have an adaptation that's a fusion of these of these two visions, and then we kind of in the second movie we have like a full Del Toro kind of take on Hellboy, where it's it's bare minimum Mignola. I mean, we have Mignola characters, and it's very much like Mignola is the jumping off point for an original like fully Del Toro thing. So I I don't know. It's like it's interesting to see Del Toro work in the aesthetic and seeing Del Toro kind of take a stab at the adaptation. That's not like verbatim, but it it it, it, it is there is. There is kind of like a bumping up of ideas with the movie that Del Toro wants to make and then the movie that uh, the starting place of Mignola. And again, I can't really say, I, I really wish I could say definitively if like the studio note was like the love triangle. That really does feel like that's the anchor around the movie's neck, you know? Uh-huh. That is like that is you know that's like that is the one thing for me that really again when I was me. watching it last night, I was just like, my god, like. I, like I am genuinely into most of the other stuff going on in this movie, but the love triangle is just eating up like large chunks of screen time. Yeah. But again, I, I do. Again, I have a respect looking back on it now more than I did way back when. You know, where with the whole like the plotting and the Rasputin. Thing. I mean, I look kinder on Rasputin, but I agree. In comparison, there's not much there. But I think taking it on its own, the movie does have. A lot going for it. I feel like it's a, it's a kind of movie where it doesn't really need like a big bad per se, if that makes sense. Like yeah. Rasputin is more of a plot device than an actual character. Well, that's the thing. He's more a revelation. He's more a revelation. Right, of right. Who you are yeah. the end of the world, and then you know, you know, and with kind of like a, a, against an iconography of Hellboy, which is him fighting like a giant monster. You know, uh-huh. it's ultimately what it is. But it's uh, you know, still like at the end of the day, this thing is still like. If you're ever gonna like have one bite at the apple and just try to bring that comic on the screen, like this is how you do it. And the fact that they weren't really, again, love trying to notwithstanding, they were, you know, doing this. You know, they get they pretty much got everything they wanted, which is impressive for the time to do that. And we're having to make you know the compromise and other comic book films and stuff at the time. But again, Catwoman being like an example, like we'll get you a Catwoman movie. Can we have? Can she be Selena Kyle? No, no. <laughs> she had like, the classic costume. Get out of no. town. No. <laughs> Oh, uh, can it at least be set in Gotham City? What are you fucking nuts? Gotham who? <laughs> did, did you see Batman and Robin? No, it's verboten. No. Oh my god. <laughs> Madman? No. If anyone right. says Batman, it better be a baseball player. I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Is she brought to life by cats? That one we can do. <laughs> anyway. All right. All right. Okay, that round things up. Yeah, we should thank the folks. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, you guys were on fire tonight in the chat. I really appreciate it. Little Blue, Co Geos, uh, Wart Monarch briefly popped up, as well as Mutale. Let's see, I believe I got everyone. Am I missing anyone, Dragon? Uh, did you mention Wart Monarch? Ah uh, yes, Wart War Monarch briefly popped up. Yes, yeah, I mentioned Mutelli, Little Blue, yes. Code Geass, and I thought no, I guess it was Mutelli. So, yep, we got everyone. Okay. All right, all right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us, and let's see what's coming up on the docket this week. Just to kind of round things out. We got memoirs coming up. Dragon, it was a fucking crazy episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm. I'm excited yeah. to talk about that. We had to bump it to uh, to Tuesday to get this in, but man, it was a crazy episode. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, look forward to all that. Memoirs, the return of animated Batcave. All also the, the, the Invincible finale. Of course, of course, yeah. All coming up this week. All right, y'all. Have a good night. See y'all later. What makes a man a man? <laughs> 
what I grew 